Hey all, before we get on with today's episode, I wanted to let you know that I will be speaking at the Innovator MD World Congress 2021. This event is from August 2nd to August 8th, and it's in San Francisco, but it will be hosted virtually as well. If you would like to participate and watch my presentation and the dozens of other great medical innovators out there, then go to innovatormd.com and you can use a special discount code SPEAKERREF for speaker referral, and that will give you a 50% discount on your code. So join me and join the rest of us at Innovator MD's World Congress this year. Hope to see you there. Now let's get on with the episode. Welcome to the Rounds to Residency podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Each episode, get clinical rotation advice and tips to prepare for your externships and residency in healthcare. We interview preceptors and physician educators who will prepare you for your rotation and improve your clinical experience. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. Welcome back. Welcome back. Today, we are joined by Dr. Amy Fogelman, who is board certified in internal medicine. And our focus here is going to be a little different, and it's on medical legal concerns and issues that have arisen. And she founded MedLaw Consulting. So Dr. Fogelman, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. I know we've been planning this for quite some time, so it's really nice that we can finally meet and speak and cover these topics that you know probably aren't covered that frequently in medical school. At least they weren't in mine. So glad that you're here. I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much. And then I have to ask, icebreaker question here. What is the biggest challenge that you see right now facing medical students and residents in internal medicine in particular? Yeah. So, you know, I think actually the biggest challenge facing medical students and residents is is similar to the same challenge facing attendings, which is really burnout. You know, I think that the reasons are, are really multifaceted. Everything from you know, increased administrative burdens and less time with patients to obviously all of the issues that happened with the pandemic. But, you know, I didn't experience burnout until about PGY10. But now we're seeing it, you know, even in medical students. And so I think it's just really important because of the downstream effects in our healthcare system. That's just very concerning. And also just personally for each person, it's it's not a good feeling. Definitely. I mean, some of the latest research that I read as of about a year ago was that a lot of it starts in medical school. You see more students or at least the correlation between students facing burnout and physicians facing burnout was quite significant. So that's why a lot of theories are coming out. Well, maybe this isn't really just a doctor thing. It's happening way before that. And I can only imagine what the research is going to show after this pandemic. It's very sad, actually. And I think it's so multifaceted. I think we could talk about this for you know, the entire time and not, not talk about the rest of the stuff. But I think that our patients who aren't in medicine are also experiencing burnout. And that's affecting us as well, because we're dealing with people who are just not at their best. And that can be challenging as well. We're stressed out. Dealing with stressed out patients is a (laughs) terrible combination. (laughs) Terrible. It's awful. So I I am kind of curious, what made you switch from, I know you were a preceptor before and you have a lot of experience in the medical field and in the training field in medicine. What made you switch over to this medical legal aspect? Well, you know, it's an interesting story. So, you know, I was a primary care doctor for like 18 years at first at Mass General Hospital and then more recently at Beth Israel Deaconess, both in Boston. And, you know, I was doing a lot of projects in addition to seeing my patients and doing a lot of education of the medical students and the residents. and. I burnt out. And so it was actually my husband who said to me, Amy, you don't have to keep doing this. Like, like, stop. 
and it was such a good, such good advice because I really stopped what I was doing and took a minute and I can talk to you about this later in the podcast, or we can talk about it now. I found out that there were so many things that you can do with your medical degree in as an internist, but not even just as an internist besides seeing patients that I was not aware of. And so I met with this career coach. It was completely life-changing. She looked at, you know, what it was intrinsically inside of me that I was good at, that I enjoyed doing, that I wanted to do. I had like a thousand cups of coffee with non-clinical physicians and just said, you know, what's your life like? What, what do you do during the day? And it was funny, actually. I realized that my husband is not a physician. He's an attorney. And over the table for years, I've been giving him free medical legal advice about his cases. And it was like a light bulb went off that, oh, this is interesting. This is something that other attorneys may need my assistance with this. And I'm really good at it and I really like it. And so I created a company based on that. And it's been so good. It's I've been, you know, using my creative parts of myself that I haven't used since like elementary school. It's really fun. I'm really enjoying it. Nice. I think that's a huge issue, in my opinion anyway, is that when you're in the medical education field, you know, when you're in medical school or even early residency, you don't really see the other options necessarily. I know there are some groups that are working more on the non-clinical aspect and bringing this increased awareness to physicians. But when you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, when you only see this one path and a lot of things are being thrown in that path, I come across it every day, <laughs> then it's going to increase your burnout, that stress level that's associated with it. So I think just being aware that whether you go into clinical practice or not is not really necessarily the end goal. It's not necessarily the best fit for you either. Knowing what other options exist out there and being more in the medical education sphere so far, it really can take a lot of that burden and burnout off of your shoulders. I think that's really true. And I think your listeners are at an advantage that they're really trying to learn about the ins and outs of the different things that there are. I mean, I was so silly. When I did my medical school, I thought, oh, the only residencies out there must be the only things that they require me. I mean, I didn't even know about certain things. When I went into residency, there were a preliminary residents in fields that I, I didn't know what they were. And so the fact that I made a choice for my career without having considered all of the potential options is just nuts. You know, I probably didn't have enough time, and there's a lot of reasons why I did that, but it ended up being fine. <laughs> I don't, I don't. <laughs> it was not the best way to make a huge decision that affects your future. The way I chose my residency was that I really, really wanted to be like my medical intern when I was a sub I. She was so smart. And so thoughtful. And I was like, I want to be like her. And that's how I chose my field. Now, internship is one year. <laughs> I've been an internist for <laughs> 20 years. So for that to be the reason that I selected my field is silly. And so I think it's really smart for your listeners to be hearing all the different options and hearing what attendings do in the, with their lives and kind of really considering the, the vast choices that there are out there. But the other thing I want to say is that, you know, I was also on the mistaken, I thought that once you got on the treadmill, you were stuck and, oh, you go to internship, you do the residency, you choose the specialty. I didn't understand that actually you can stop seeing patients and there's a vast plethora of options to choose at that point. 
So there's always options. <laughs> You're never stuck. I love that we're getting so many physician endorsements for this show. So <laughs> thank you for adding to that. We need to put a little sponsorship recommended by your doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's extremely important, though, because two things that really stood out is one, yeah, a lot of students make decisions based on their limited experience during rotations, during their clerkships. And that is unfortunate because they might not have had the best rotations in this or that, that they might be better suited for, or they might, as you explained, really like this one preceptor and think, oh, this is how life's going to be. But it's so variable. It's just, that brings up the second thing is we're always talking about informed consent to patients, but I feel like students aren't really informed of all of their options either. So you get stuck in certain narrow views of what your future, what your career are going to be. And then when it comes time to assess your life and it's like, wow, I didn't actually want to be doing it or doing it this way. It's really unfortunate that that's extremely common in the healthcare system right now. Yeah, I love that concept of informed consent for students. I think it's a great concept. And now for students, I know since you did precept students for many years, and in particular, you were precepting students from Harvard, which anyone that is in the medical field and most people not are going to recognize Harvard Med as one of those top tier schools. And I probably want to probably the complete reverse of that. So <laughs> I'm curious to hear what your experiences were with those students. Yeah. I mean, so, okay. So I taught Harvard medical students in Harvard affiliated residents. I did my residency at a Harvard affiliated place, but I went to medical school at Boston University. So it's a bit different. And actually, the education is a bit different. And, you know, part of that was me having a little bit of a chip on my shoulder, right? And like wanting to prove, you know, I'm just as smart as you. But I will say, Harvard students are so smart for the most part, incredibly impressive. They're amazing, amazing. I mean, some of these students that I've precepted are brilliant, 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 brilliant. But when they're coming to me, and so I was an ambulatory primary care physician, so I had my practice affiliated with Mass General Hospital or Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and they would come to do a rotation for either once a week for the entire year, or more often it would be a more intensive kind of several times a week for that rotation. So there were some things that they were doing, not all of them, but some of them that were really driving me bananas. And so at first it was like, really, I, I didn't know how to handle it. And so I ended up deciding that I would create this list of expectations for them, where I basically listed the things that drive me bonkers so that they would know before they started not to do these things. And then if they do it, it's on them. Like they're informed. They can make it like they can do it or they cannot do it. It's, you know, it's up to you. If you want to so proceed at your own risk. So I actually, I pulled this out in preparation for our talk because I was curious what was on this list because it's been, it's been a little while since I looked at it. And I will tell you that everything that's on this list is because of somebody that didn't do this before. So the first one is, and actually I listened to your episode with Dr. Frank Ockeson and I agree with what he said as well. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that right. Did I say it right? I think Ockeson? it's Ockeson, but I always Ockeson. mispronounce names okay. too, so don't take my word for it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So he said, and I agree with this, dress appropriately. So business attire. So, you know, don't wear your scrubs. It's not your time to show your fashion. You want to be conservative. You don't want to be remembered for how you dress because you don't want to make anyone be uncomfortable. And then there's some practical things with that. No open toed shoes. Your nails cannot be long. You can't have artificial nails. And the worst one was somebody had long, dirty nails. Blech. So, you know, nails clean and trimmed. Another one is that you need to be on time. And for me, 
That means like arrive before the first patient arrives. And this is something that sometimes Harvard students, I don't want to call it arrogance, but maybe you need to be there first. And if something is go, if you have a a lecture, something that's going along that you're going to miss, page me to let me know. So I'm not expecting you. Now, this one is really important. And this is how you're going to impress your preceptor. So if you see a patient and any labs are ordered on that patient, you should find out the results before the preceptor does. Because then you say to them, oh, hey, the creatinine came back and I saw it was a little high. You will get gold stars if you do that. What drives me nuts is when I am the person telling the medical student what the results were on a patient that we saw together. That's not my job. They should be interested and excited and want to know these things and helpful. And it's actually more helpful for them to tell me rather than me telling them. Yeah, it's wasting your time at that point because they should be formulating a theory at that point. And then the feedback that you give, that's the educational part. Exactly. Exactly. A hundred percent. And, you know, I think that sometimes students are a little confused about that. They need more direction. They want me to say, oh, you have to do X, you know, to really give them homework. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to babysit you. We see patients together. We ordered tests. You should be writing the notes on the patient. You should be knowing what we ordered. And if you don't understand why we ordered it, you shouldn't go and look that up so you get it. And if you still have questions the next day, then ask me. But that's how you're learning about these things. And then the other thing, there's two other things that are important, which are, well, three. One is that when you have a clinical question, look it up. And that's your home. I mean, that's how you learn. This is something that Harvard students do really, really well. This is how they're, a lot of medical schools, I think, are changing to this kind of curriculum where it's based on the patients that you see. That's how the things are going to stick in your mind is to put it in a clinical context. So look it up and then you should present it to me the next day. Say like, oh, hey, I, this came up. I looked it up and this is what I found out. It seems like you're bragging and it kind of is, but we love it. Internal medicine physicians, we want you to nerd out. So like, go for it. We will get gold stars up the wazoo. Like you probably shouldn't do that to your surgery attendings, but internists, like we love that. And you can wear your scrubs for surgery too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> The other thing is, if you do look something up, you give sources, do not, this is a big issue, don't source up to date, okay? That is not a legitimate source. You need to look at primary sources. So a trick is you can use up to date to look it up, and then you can see what they referenced, and then look at the primary source and read it that way just to, you know, so you can kind of trick it so you don't necessarily have to do a PubMed search, but you should know if you want to be the level of a Harvard Med student, you should be able to know about the primary sources and give those sources and internal medicine physician. That's what we want to hear. We want to hear about the JAMA study and, and which trial it was and all of that stuff. Yeah, I have not heard that. I mean, I've definitely had preceptors say, oh, just go look on up to date. So they weren't necessarily interested as much in the primary source. And to clarify for anyone that might be earlier on in their education, you know, primary source is the one that did the research. Secondary source, such as your textbook or such as up to date, they are finding some of the best studies and synthesizing the information for you, but they're not the ones actually conducting the study. So it's interesting to hear from you that. Up to date is not a legitimate source for that because, well, it's just a first for me. <laughs> Did you know you can find and schedule your own clinical rotations? Students can reach out to preceptors nationwide and schedule their own rotations. You can even refer a friend, earning you credit towards clinical externships of your choosing. 
Go to findarotation.com for more information. That's Find a Rotation, your medical and healthcare clinical rotations platform. If your attending asks you to give a presentation the next day on Browns about the best treatment for congestive heart failure today, then there's certain seminal studies that have been done that explain why we treat with certain things that we do. And so you should know what those seminal studies are and not say, well, it's just because up to date said so. That's what the expectation is in internal medicine at a top tier place. Okay. One more question before yeah. I, I let you finish yeah. your list. <laughs> what do you think about the expert recommendations? Because if we're talking about cardiology, you could go to the Heart Association, American Heart Association, and finds their recommendations. But a lot of times, medical specialty organizations make expert recommendations not based on evidence. Which is exactly why you need to know where all of those recommendations are coming from, which is the trials themselves. So that is a hunt. You, you explained why we want to know the, the primary information as opposed to the recommendations. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. Sorry, I keep cutting you off. I'll let you finish yeah. your list. <laughs> you just need to be interested. Even if you know you're going into orthopedic surgery and you arrive and you're like, I hate internal medicine. I hate writing notes. I don't want to do this. Just pretend and be nice. You don't have to pretend that you love internal medicine. You need to learn these things. And this is how you're going to learn it. And if you're too, you know, too cool for school, you're actually going to be a worse surgeon because you didn't get these basics as a medical student. So, you know, I don't expect you to be at the same level as someone who really wants to go into internal medicine. They're going to be the nerd out gold star student and the orthopedic surgeon student may not, you know, do all of that, but at least they're still following up on everything. They're still, if they don't understand what it is, they're looking it up. You know, there's still some basic things that you want to do. To show appreciation to your preceptor for the time they're dedicating to teach you will get you yeah. a long way. It sounds like this is also probably the third time that some comparison to this has been made, but always reminds me of the show Scrubs. You have the internal medicine nerds and then the surgeon jocks. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I haven't watched that in a long time, but it was made a show for a reason. You know? It was actually voted as one of the most accurate medical shows one year, which is hilarious because <laughs> it's a comedy. Really but <laughs> <laughs> Great show. Okay, so we now have a lot of the expectations and mistakes that even the Harvard medical students, yes, with a little pinky in the air there. <laughs> <laughs> They're not make. like that. They're not they're I love them. They're great. They really are good. They're they're good. I went to a Caribbean school, so like complete opposite, I'm sure, in so many ways. Well, all right. So with some of these potential issues that we've discussed, I know that there are a couple of topics we brought up in our communications before that I really want to get some clarification on. And the first one is the delay or failure to diagnose as a medical expert. So what you're talking about, just to kind of like step back a little bit, is so part of what I do is I'm, I'm a medical expert for things that are inside my niche, but more importantly, I match attorneys to medical experts in their fields. And I also kind of teach newbie experts how to get into the field. So being a medical expert is a really, really cool side gig for somebody who's clinically active. You can do it in any field. Can't do it if you're not seeing patients. And so when we're thinking about, so it doesn't just have to be medical malpractice cases. There's other cases that need medical experts. If you got into a car accident and the plaintiff suffered some kind of a damage, you know, an elbow, a hurt elbow or something, they may need an expert to explain the extent of their injuries. But when we're talking about a medical malpractice case, this can happen when there's an issue like a failure to diagnose. So that's a common 
primary care expert witness request. And that would be like, for example, if a patient came in with a cough for a really, really long time and you never, you know, really did the workup that maybe they were a smoker and they ended up having lung cancer and you had missed the diagnosis for some period of time. So that would be potential failure to diagnose medical malpractice case. Another one might be if this is like the bane of a primary care doctor's existence, you know, every time a patient has any kind of imaging, it gets sent to the primary care doctor, right? 1,000, 2,000 patients on your panel and they're going, you know, to this, that, and the other thing. It's hard to keep on top of all this stuff. If they got a CT scan for something and, it, you know, maybe it's not in the finding, in the, in the interpretation, but in the findings, there's some kind of a mass noted. That's on the PCP is, is may get sued for that if they don't follow that up. You know, whether that is, is fair or not fair, we, we could debate, but that's another one where a primary care doctor may be called to talk about what the standard of care is in, in that case. And it's interesting because as we seem to be changing a lot of things in medicine these days, especially since the pandemic has hit, but I know there's been a push towards more team activity within the hospital where you don't just have your primary care physician being the go-to person. Have you noticed any potential medical legal issues in that realm? Like who is actually responsible if you work as a team? Is everyone responsible or does it fall on the lead or how does that work? Great question, Chase. And it's something that I think is going to be have to be worked out in our courts because sometimes things will happen that was done by a non-physician provider and maybe the primary care physician wasn't aware. And sometimes they're being named in cases. I've been on some cases in Massachusetts where they are not necessarily naming the physician, which is for me as a physician, that's heartening. But I think it depends on the state laws, um, the way that they are. Yeah, they do vary a lot state to state. They seem to be constantly shifting. So it's really hard to focus on your medical training and continuing education, but also being aware of the constantly shifting legal aspects. Yeah. I mean, I think that that definitely this fear of getting sued is something that is definitely part of burnout. I will say there are, depending on your field, you're going to get sued. And I know this now even more so because when I'm matching physicians as experts to attorneys, one of the questions I ask is, have you ever been sued? And depending on their field, the answer is, oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's like every single person I is like, oh, yeah, this is completely normal. It's very field dependent, but I think that it can be so heavy. And depending on your personality, you just feel terrible. And I think, you know, the way that it's so pointed towards the physician, it feels like, you know, it's going to ruin your career. It doesn't necessarily do that, especially if it's like a systemic failure. So one thing that is interesting that I don't know that you're aware of, but like in Massachusetts, they've capped nonprofits where you can only sue them for a certain amount of money. I think it's 100000 or maybe $200,000. So the way that plaintiff attorneys get around this is that they name individuals. So rather than naming, you know, XYZ hospital, which may actually be really the thing at fault because of their EHR system that they designed or the people that they hired or some sort of system error, they end up, you know, suing the physician and the radiologist and the surgeon that were all involved so that they get individuals named and, you know, the physician themselves don't pay for anything because your medical malpractice that the hospital is covering pays for it. But it's a really messed up situation <laughs> because it, it is a person, it hurts you personally. 
Yeah, that sounds extremely stressful. And I think I've heard that in certain states, but not sure which ones that might apply to. Not the cap on nonprofits, but that they generally are always going to, when possible, uh, attach the physicians' names in there just to have more potential people to go after, if nothing else. So, very stressful. And out of curiosity, since you said some specialties are like, oh yeah, I'm getting sued this week. <laughs> yeah. Which ones are more likely to be sued? Uh, neurosurgery, vascular surgery, OBGYN. Okay. I don't like surgery, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. And OBGYN, I wouldn't, well. Because of, if there's a, outcome it's really devastating because the ob yeah right when that was coming out of my mouth i thought of an Dude. instance during my <laughs> ob guide rotation that was not pleasant so yeah okay i can understand that one. yeah if you have an, a, a child that is born with a noxic brain injury that could have been prevented that's probably the worst thing that could possibly happen well it sounds like Possibly internal med is not as liable as some of well, the others. Well, you know, it depends. Um, but you're still the primary care for most. Depends how anal you are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. There was one last topic I wanted to bring up, and that was involving the kind of differences in being an MD versus a mid-level when you're discussing these sort of legal ramifications. And how does that differ? The standard of care is a legal definition, and it depends on your state somewhat, but it, it really is a legal definition. We, as physicians or as a medical community, can't say anything about the standard of care. It's not like bad people that are doing it. The standard of care is talking about a similarly trained person in a similar circumstance as you, you know, with the similar resources. The idea is that you're trying to compare apples to apples. So you wouldn't want to say, if I'm giving a standard of care opinion, I would say what I thought the standard of care is for someone like me. I wouldn't be able to give a standard of care opinion about a cardiologist because I don't practice cardiology. You know, so in general, it probably makes more sense for nurse practitioners to opine on what is standard of care for nurse practitioners and physicians to opine on standard of care for physicians. And that's because of the legal definition of what it means. And I know a lot of physicians get really wrinkled about that. And I understand why, because they're like, I don't understand because a nurse practitioner could basically order any of the tests I can order and those have the same risks, but they have a different amount of training. So based on what it means, standard of care, you have to give them the benefit of giving them an opinion based on someone with that same training. It's like, it wouldn't be fair for me as a primary care physician treating hypertension if I had like a nephrologist who's a hypertension expert saying the way he would treat it because he's had additional training and you can't expect me to follow exactly what he's doing. That's kind of the legal reasoning. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. <laughs> that's just the way that it is. Yeah. If you're talking about a nurse <laughs> practitioner or physician associate, I believe is the most recent transition in the name to let's say internal medicine, general internist to a fellowship specialist, I mean, there's a lot of different barriers there, a lot of jumps you have to make in several years of education in between each jump. So, I mean, that's something that not even all medical and healthcare professionals and students understand completely, let alone the general public. So it seems interesting that if it's a consensus sort of definition, it's going to run into a lot of potential obstacles. Well, on a positive note, <laughs> say, I think we've definitely covered some interesting topics here that we haven't covered any medical legal stuff in the past, and this has been great and very informative. I'm wondering if you have any other pearls of wisdom you'd like to share? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess just on the topic of burnout, 
I think that there's many potential ways to guard against it. I actually think that working in private practice where you are your own boss is a good way to give you more control over your life. And so that's something that I think that medical students and residents should really consider. I think you should always be taking your own burnout temperature and, you know, take vacations when you need it. Set limits if you can. And that might be with your family, you know, when you're going through residency, or it may be with bosses and patients when you're in other, you know, other times. And then if you're in a toxic environment, you should leave. You can leave. There is a door. And sometimes it leads to amazing places that you never expected. Very good. Very good advice. I love that. Yeah, everyone probably thinks, oh, there's a door, but on the other side is a cliff. <laughs> but <laughs> there are other right. options that might be more suitable to your particular skill sets and your life balance and everything else that you are trying to achieve in your life. So I do love that. <laughs> well, is there anywhere that the audience can find you for more information or reach out to you? Yes. Yeah, so I'm on social media. My handle is Amy Fogelman, F-O-G-E-L-M-A-N-M-D. And so I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I might be on TikTok, but I do that basically to spy on my daughter. And then on LinkedIn, I'm just Amy Fogelman. And yeah, I just, you know, the last thing I want to say is that being a physician, even though it's a really hard road, I do think it's incredibly rewarding and worth it. There's just so many options that are out there and you can have several careers within the physician career. And I think I'm like the perfect example of that. So I don't think that a lot of the non-physician options, although maybe you can do primary care and it's sort of similar if you're a nurse practitioner, all of the options kind of afterwards are different. And so that really made having that degree worth it. I also, you know, want to say that being able to learn about the body and everything about it, you know, I'm an internal medicine nerd, but that's like so cool. And so you should take your time to learn all of that stuff so that you can solve the puzzles and the mysteries. That's something that you can't really be rushed through. That's a great point. I do agree that your options are going to be very different depending on your degree, your path, your ambitions. So I'm glad that you really clarified that for us in many different aspects from the burnout aspect, from the medical legal aspect, and just that there are other options out there. It's extremely important to realize that whether you're willing to make the jump now or later, be aware that it's there it is a great cushion and burnout preventer, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, I will just say that you have the opportunity to do some medical expert work starting as early as residency. I mean, it's not as often, but you can. So it's definitely something to consider. And you can follow me on Instagram where I give a lot of tips about it. It's a great side gig. It's a great way to make some extra cash. Awesome. <laughs> well, Dr. Amy Fogelman, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. The Rounds to Residency podcast is powered by Med School Coach. To access Med School Coach services, like USMLE tutoring or residency admissions advising, visit our website at medschoolcoach.com. Good luck as you prepare for your board exams, and we hope you tune in again next time.